folks, another exciting physics video. 3-2, we're going to be talking about relative motion and projectile motion today. So we're really going to be honing in on some of those equations that we've talked about previously uh, in terms of the five equations of motion. We're going to be applying a little bit of a twist to that, looking at vectors and how we can take some of the information that we learned from vectors utilizing sine, cosine, and tangent uh, to be able to figure out relative motion and projectile motion. So I'm really excited for this video. Uh, it might be a little bit of a longer video. That's why you're going to get two weeks to be able to work on this material uh, because it is a little bit complex and we are a little bit ahead of where we need to be. So super excited to bring this video to you today, guys. This video, keep in mind, is sponsored by Big K Diet Cola. That's right, Big K Diet Cola. All the taste, no calories, Big K Diet Cola. Oh, very refreshing. So refreshing, I'm ready to talk about our, hopefully by the end of this video, you should be able to explain the concept of relative motion. Consider relative motion velocities as vectors and calculate and solve for equations related to projectile motion. So when we talk about vectors and relative motion, it's important to keep in the back of our mind that relative motion just simply means the motion of one object relative to another object. So let's look at the example below. The train is moving at 9 meters per second to the right, and the man is walking at 2 meters per second in the train, also to the right. What is the relative motion to the person standing on the ground? Well, if you're the person in the train, it's going to appear that you are walking at 2 meters per second because you are moving with the train. However, the observer on the outside of the train is going to visualize you moving at 11 meters per second. Those particular vectors of relative motion can be added together. On the opposite side of that, if the man were walking in the opposite direction, let's say the man is going to the left rather than going to the right, it would appear to the ground-based observer there that the man is moving 7 meters per second to the right. Remember that velocity can be utilized as a vector as well, and that's what we mean when we talk about relative motion. The, the ground-based observer would think that the man is walking 7 meters per second the opposite direction. Reason being is we can add and subtract vectors, just like what we talked about in our previous video. So again, velocities can be used like vectors when solving for relative motion. This includes both the x and the y axis, and in order to determine the relative velocities of both the x and y axis, you can then determine the velocity of the resulting vector by using Pythagorean theorem, sine, cosine, and tangent, just like what we've done previously. So let's consider a man who climbs a ladder to the roof of a railroad car. If the man climbs the ladder with a speed of 0.2 meters per second and the train goes forward at 0.70 meters per second, what is the speed and direction of the worker relative to the ground? So again, we need to look at the information that we have available here. So we have a speed of a man climbing the ladder of 0.20 meters per second. So the man is going up the ladder 0.20 meters per second. The train is going forward at 0.70 meters per second and it wants to know the speed and direction of the worker relative to the ground. So again, we can utilize our concept of triangles, Pythagorean theorem, sine, cosine, and tangent in order to be able to figure this out. Remember that, you know, with any triangle, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So we can solve for c, 0 0.20 squared plus 0 0.70 squared uh, equals c squared. We can take the square root of both of those values, and then what we end up getting is the resulting magnitude of that particular vector. You'll see here is 0.73, and remember the unit for that because we're looking at velocity, not necessarily distance here, meters per second. All right, so we get that value. Now it wants to know the angle, in particular this angle here, and the direction in the worker is working relative to the ground. So in order to get the proper angle here, we may want to look at this a little bit differently, just to kind of help us out. We're going 0.7 meters this direction, 0.2 this way, and then 0.73 here. And then it wants to know this angle. So understand, we want the direction to work relative to the ground. That's why we're rewriting the triangle in a little bit different way. And you can use variety. You can use the inverse sine, cosine, and tangent. I'm just going to use the inverse tangent. that's of your y value, um, your opposite over your adjacent. 
and that's going to give us our angle, and our angle is 16 degrees. So again, it's all about utilizing those triangles in order to be able to solve for what is unknown. Let's move on. So we have quite a bit of information here. We have flow of water, uh, the boat we're going in is 6.1 meters per second. So that's how fast our boat's going. So we're kind of going 6.1 meters per second that way. About points at an angle, it's 25 degrees upstream, but we also have a, a river that's flowing this way at 1.4 meters per second. So the really important part is to get out of this, the 6.1 at a 25 degree angle, the x and y vectors. Because if we can get those, then we can take into account the 1.4 meters per second going uh, the opposite direction and figure out what's going on. Remember that we can use sine, cosine, and tangent to figure that out. So we can take 6.1 times sine 25 degrees. That's going to give us our y. 6.1 cosine 25 degrees gives us our x. So again, we want to be able to get this particular vector here um, into its x and y components. It's going to be 2.6 meters per second. And for x, Five point five meters per second. The other interesting piece of information here is that we have a current flowing against us in the y direction, right? Remember, the y goes up and down, x is left and right. So, in order to get the actual velocity, we're going to actually have to subtract one point four meters per second. The reason being is that this is uh, we're going to try to go upstream. So the flow of water is actually against what we're trying to do here. So 2.6 meters per second minus 1.4 meters per second is going to give us a y vector velocity of 1.2 meters per second. So now that we know our x and y vectors, now we can solve for the speed of the boat and get the direction of relative travel, again by using Pythagorean theorem. So we're going to take 5.5 squared plus 1.2 squared equals c squared. Should be able to solve for c. It is 5.6 meters squared. And then again, we can use our inverse tangent to get the angle inverse tangent y over x. gives us theta of roughly 12 degrees. So again, the key components here is isolating the x and y components, and then also taking into consideration any other things that may impact those x and y components. Once we get them, then we can just utilize Pythagorean theorem, sine, cosine, and tangent in order to be able to solve for any other variable we're looking at. Let's move on. So in relationship with all of this is projectile motion. Now a projectile is an object that is thrown, kicked, batted or launched into motion and then allowed to follow a path determined solely by the influence of gravity. In this particular instance, we're going to ignore air resistance and do keep in mind that acceleration due to gravity is a constant downward magnitude that is 9.81 meters per second squared. So that's going to impact the y-axis in terms of the gravity. We also need to think about the x-axis as well. There will be no acceleration on the x-axis because the ball will be moving at a constant velocity along the x-axis. So we really don't need to consider that when we're going through and calculating these problems. So what I'd like you to do is to consider the position time equation we learned in a previous video. This should look fairly familiar to you. Independence of motion, just like independence of uh, distance, means that we can break this down into position time equations for both the x and the y axis. So if we have information about just horizontal movement or vertical movement, we can break this down into the information below and then work to solve for some of the other unknown variables.
So for example here, we have the very same equation. The only difference is that we're looking at the acceleration and velocity on the x-axis versus the y-axis. So if we consider acceleration for tossing a projectile, there would be no acceleration in the x-direction. Acceleration only occurs in the y-direction, and that would be due to gravity and it would be downward, so we have to keep in mind that because it is downward, it is negative g, negative 9.8 meters per second. So as a result, we can rearrange our position time equations for projectiles. Since there is no acceleration on the x-axis, a would equal zero, and you could get rid of those variables altogether. On the y-axis, however, we need to consider gravity. And since gravity is going to be focused on a negative value, um, instead of having plus one-half acceleration t squared, we switch that positive to a negative, so we can still use 9.8 meters per second squared as our acceleration due to gravity when we're looking at the y-axis. So let's start by taking a look at the question at hand. A person skateboarding with a constant speed of 1.30 meters per second releases a ball from a height of 1.25 meters above the ground. Given that x is 0 and y is 1.25 meters, find x of f and y of f for the times at t equals 0 0.250 seconds, and b, t equals 0 0.500 seconds. Recall that g is 9.81 meters per second squared. So let's take a look at some of the information that we have. We have to keep in mind that the person is skateboarding with a constant speed of 1.30 meters per second. So that is our initial velocity. in the x direction, right? Because the individual is moving left to right. So that would indicate that that is the velocity of the x direction. At least initially. The y velocity initially is zero. We're also given that x is equal to zero y is equal to 1.25. We're given two values for time, and we're also given gravity. So we should be able to plug in and solve for the final place of x and the final place of y. So let's start with part a. Our initial x position is 0, plus our initial velocity, 1.30, and our time, 0 0.250. And to solve for y, our initial y, 1.25, plus the velocity uh, initially in the y direction is 0 times time minus one half nine point eight one those cancel and now we can just plug our numbers in and solve for our unknown so x of f will be 0.325 meters you have to do a little bit more work here T should be 0 0.250. What you should get solving for y there is 0.944 meters. All right. And then we're going to do the exact same process for b. Except this time we're going to use 0.5 seconds. And we solve. 
answers. So again, the key thing to keep in mind here, with all that information given you in the problem, it really helps. It really helps to visualize this. So think about the person skateboarding with that constant speed. You really need to keep in mind what their initial velocities are on both the x and y axis. That's really going to be helpful for you when you go through and start doing more complex problems. Obviously, the skateboarder moving with the constant speed is moving along the x axis. That's why we were able to give x uh, velocity an initial value. Y value, because the ball is not moving along the y axis, it's only moving along the x axis initially. We don't give it a particular value. So a couple things that we need to keep in mind is that uh, in order to understand more about projectile motion, objects just simply aren't dropped when somebody is moving, like in the previous problem. Projectiles can be launched along any angle. Now, in general, an ideal projectile follows a parabolic path, which comes from the word parabola, um, regardless of how it's launched. So typically, you're going to see a fairly even parabola. Now, in real life, we know that this isn't necessarily the case because with these types of problems, we're not taking into account things like air resistance and other factors that may have a role in affecting the trajectory of the projectile itself. So remember how we focused on vectors in our previous video and we talked a lot about how the X and Y motion um, is independent of one another. Well, that is the same case for velocity as well. So we can take the concept of independence of motion of the X and Y axis and apply it to velocity formulas. So as a result, we get some really interesting information here because we can take this data here and apply it to the x and y axis independently. Remember that the acceleration on the x axis, we're not really focusing on that. So that equals zero. So you get that final of the vx final um, is equal to the vx initial. So the movement of the object along the x axis does not change. Pretty straightforward there. Um, however, however, the y axis is different because we need to take into account the acceleration due to gravity. So we plug in gravity, and as we do, we keep in mind that it's negative g based on the relative motion of the object. And so we get the formula v, uh, the velocity of y, final is equal to the velocity of y in the initial direction minus uh, g times t. So we can utilize these formulas as well to be able to calculate motion. So you throw a baseball from the roof of a house to a friend on the ground. The ball has an initial velocity of 12.0 meters per second in the horizontal direction. After one second, how fast is the ball moving in A, the X direction, and B, the Y direction? Well, let's remember the formulas that we just talked about. I'm going to switch to blue here. Remember that the velocity of X initially is equal to the velocity of X final. Well, if the ball has an initial velocity of 12 meters per second in the horizontal direction, that means that this value here is 12.0 meters per second, which means that the final velocity is going to be 12.0 meters per second. Okay, so that one's easy to solve, especially if we're focusing on the x direction. Now the y direction is a little bit trickier. Um, you throw a baseball. So initially, um, as you throw a baseball, you know, it's going to go that. So the initial velocity in the y direction is actually zero. Let's go ahead and get that formula up here. So the velocity of y final is equal to the velocity of y initially minus g times t. So again, the initial velocity in the y direction is actually zero. We know that acceleration due to gravity is 9.81, and it's only going a second. So this is actually pretty straightforward here. Um, the velocity of y final is going to be negative 9.81 meters per second. Again, the reason it's negative is that the ball is moving down. So again, if you think about this like a, a Cartesian plane, right, the ball is moving in the negative direction. And remember, with velocity, we have to take into account the magnitude. So do keep those things in mind. But these are equations, again, just look for the information. Uh, think about what the what is actually taking place physically, and that will help you understand your initial velocities in terms of the x or y axis. All right, let's move on. The one last thing to keep in mind is that projectiles don't always necessarily start off in the horizontal direction. We can actually get quite a few different angles as a result. Um, again, we can use sine and cosine to determine the velocity in the x and y direction if we're given velocity at a particular angle. So in this instance, we can get the velocity along the x-axis if we take the initial velocity multiplied by the cosine of the angle. 
and the uh, velocity in the y direction if we take the initial velocity times the sine of the angle. So we can actually substitute these values in for velocity time equations and position time equations in order to be able to solve for a variety of different variables. I'll honestly say that these are probably the equations you're going to use the most because these are instances where projectiles do not start off in the horizontal direction. So as a result, the initial velocity that we are going to use is going to have an x, compo x component and a y component. And we need to be able to extract those from the initial velocity altogether. So we basically just take those values and we substitute those in for the four equations we've looked at previously. And that gives us a wide variety of information that we can utilize in order to be able to solve for the equations that we're going to be taking a look at here in just a moment. Let's move on. A golfer sends the ball over a 3 meter tree that is 14 meters away. The ball lands at the same level at which it was struck after traveling a horizontal distance of 17.8 meters. If the ball left the club at an angle of 45 degrees and landed on the green 2.24 seconds later, what is the initial speed and how high was the ball when it passed over the tree? So we have quite a bit of information here. So let's break it down in terms of what we're trying to look for first. So I'm looking for the initial speed. So, okay? so that is going to be um, V I. Okay. That is our unknown. What other information do we know? Well, we know we've got a 3 meter tree, 14 meters away. Um, to get the initial speed though, we're going to want to look more at this information. So it traveled a distance of 17.8 meters. So that tells us that our x final, 17.8, our x initial is 0. We know time, and we know our angle. So we need to look at all this data and figure out what equation we're going to use. And in this instance, this equation has all the variables that we're looking for. So let's rearrange this equation to isolate V1 by itself, because again, that's what we're looking for here. We're looking for this, so we need to get that by itself. Divide on both sides. That's going to equal VI. And then we plug into our calculator and solve. We plug that into our calculator and we get the initial velocity is 13.5 meters per second. Simple enough. Now what it wants to know is how high the ball was when it passed over the tree. Well, let's look at our other variables. In this case, we want to know how high the ball is, so that's along the y-axis, so we're going to use uh, y-final is our unknown. Our initial y-value is 0. We now know our initial velocity. Again, we know the angle. And one piece of information I forgot to put in this problem um, is that it actually does tell you the time in which the ball passed over the tree and that's 1.76 seconds. So again, utilizing all this information, we can actually plug in and solve. Now again, I do apologize, this value here should be in the equation. Um, it's not, so don't freak out because it's not written there. So we can plug into the position time formula here, so y final, y initial plus v1 sine theta times t equals one half, oh sorry, not equals, 
minus one half g t squared. So plug in what we know. Yf equals initial is zero plus uh, 13.5 sine of theta, which is 54, times t, 1.76 minus 1 half, 9.81 times, sorry for the space there, uh, 1.76 squared. So again, just plug all those numbers into a calculator and solve. And so after all that math, we get our final y, 4.04 4 meters. Okay. So again, a big part of this is just making sure that we work through and identify what variables we have and what we're solving for. All right? Take your time. Read each question carefully. Don't hesitate to ask questions. You're going to get plenty of time to practice with these types of equations. So hopefully it won't be too difficult as you guys continue to work through and start so uh, continually solving these problems. Let's move on. A soccer ball is kicked from the ground with an initial speed of 12 meters per second at an angle of 32 degrees above the horizontal. What are the x and y positions of the ball 0 0.50 seconds after it is kicked? So again, a couple things we need to keep in mind. And our initial position on x is 0, and our y initial is 0. Okay, we have an initial velocity. We're also given a time and an angle. So we can use the previous two equations again to be able to solve for the final x position and the final y position. And we can do the same for y. So again, the real key focus here is just ensuring that you plug the numbers into the correct equations and making sure that you look for what you're solving for. Everything else should be pretty straightforward. So again, identify your variables, 
think about your initial positions or initial velocities, and work to solve for the unknown part of the problem. One last thing I want to cover, and I probably won't spend a whole bunch of time on it, is the concept of range. And the range of a projectile is the horizontal distance it travels prior to landing. The range is going to be given and calculated in a formula that equals uh, the initial velocity squared divided by the acceleration due to gravity times sine 2 theta. The maximum range, just to keep in mind, occurs at 45 degrees, which I think you would figure would be pretty straightforward because it's somewhere between a straight up uh, vertical toss and a straight up horizontal roll, for lack of a better term. So again, a lot of things to keep in mind here conceptually. This is probably going to be one of the longest videos I've ever made, but we're going to break it down into two weeks, so hopefully it will give you guys an opportunity to practice with these problems, take your time, do the best that you can, and as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me or let me know. Thanks, guys. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.